All righty, we are back here at allprophecyfulfilled.com on the World Wide Web, and of course, and as always on Facebook and on YouTube, it is simply All Prophecy Fulfilled. Okay, we are back after about a uh, month, month and a half hiatus from our series, The Last Days, Biblically Defined. And uh, you might recall, if you've been following, uh, we wrapped up uh, Daniel chapter 9, which was Daniel's 70 weeks. Uh, but before that, a few lessons back, uh, if you've been with us, you, you might recall that we covered chapters 8 and chapters 11, and we did that together. Uh, that is because those chapters are really dealing with the same subject matter. Now, the interesting thing, or the important thing to remember here, is that uh, when we cover chapters 8 and chapters 11, I stopped with one more reference to an end uh, remaining in chapter 11, and that was in verse 40, 11 verse 40, and that's the word Kate. Now, I didn't cover that uh, particular section of chapter 11 because uh, I thought or I said, that it might have relevance to what's going on in Daniel chapter 12, okay? So let me explain that here just for a second. So here's a little two minute review. Chapter eight gave us an outline of future kingdoms, okay? The future you know, world events that were uh, relevant to Daniel's people, Old Covenant Israel, and to redemptive history, okay? And the very next chapter, chapter 9, uh, that seems to extend or to continue chronologically down the line all the way to who? Messiah, okay? So in other words, if you take chapters 8 and chapters 9, um, you know, the, the visions and the events described span all the way from Daniel's day uh, to the future kingdoms of Medo-Persia in Greece and then the Macedonian kingdoms after it. And then in chapter 9, all the way to Messiah, that is the New Testament time period. And that's important. In fact, uh, I mentioned this in those videos. If you take chapters 10 through 12, uh, they basically do the same thing that chapters 8 and chapters 9 do, only in much more detail. So by the time that we arrive in chapter 12, uh, once again, we are undoubtedly looking at new Testament events and developments in spite of what all the futurists are going to tell you, you know, which is that chapter 12 uh, or parts of it anyway, kind of skips ahead into our future. No. So simply put, chapters 10 through 12 are following the same chronological timeline, if you will, as chapters 8 and 9, only in much more detail. Uh, and they really should be uh, viewed as a collective or literary unit or something like that. Yeah, collective unit. So I wanted to jump to chapter 12 or jump right into chapter 12 today. I, I really did, but I can't. And here's why. If Daniel chapter 12 is referring to first century events, or, and this is important, if, if you don't think they do, that's fine. Or even if you say Daniel chapter 12 uh, is referring to events in our future, if that's, what you're, if that's what you believe, okay, that's fine. But you know what? Either way, we have to explain how and will, when the text here in chapter 11 apparently jumps from the time of the Seleucid kingdom in chapter 11 to Israel's latter days in chapter 12. Okay, where does the Bible make this jump? Does that make sense? Okay, where's the change? I don't know if you see the problem yet, but let me show you. So open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 11. Now, when I covered chapter 11, again, we went all the way up to verse 35 here. <clears throat> now, it was fairly clear, I thought, that all those things were dealing with the third kingdom, okay? Specifically, the Seleucids and their persecution of the Jews, the Maccabean revolt, and so on and so forth. But here's the problem. There's 45 verses in this chapter, and I basically stopped at verse 35. Okay, now now watch this. this let me just give you, let me show you what I'm talking about. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It reads, at that time, Michael shall, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm not even going to finish that, that verse. You know why? Because it says, at that time. Okay, so immediately we have to ask the question, well, wait a minute, at what time? Okay, well, whatever events 
are, are going to transpire in chapter 12. You know what? They are simply a continuation uh, of whatever is going on in chapter 11. Okay, at that time, Michael shall stand up. Okay, well, at what time will Michael stand up? Well, again, it's connected to chapter 12. So the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12 are contextually connected. So this is an example, I think, uh, of where a chapter break really doesn't help us. In fact, it, it probably does more harm than good. So, okay, so when we dealt with chapter 11, Previously, we determined that verse 35 was still referring to the events uh, within the Seleucid time frame. So that's like almost, I don't know, 200 years before Christ or something like that, or not quite. So, so either, so we have a couple options here. Either A, the events of chapter 12 are a continuation of those same events in the Seleucid time frame, you know, putting chapter 12 uh, in the Seleucid uh, era time frame or, or the, the events surrounding it. Or B, somewhere between verses 36 and 45, there is a contextual time jump, so to speak, uh, you know, meaning the text at some point uh, changes subject matter from the Seleucids in that time period to a later time period. Now, where might this contextual jump be? Well, I think you basically have two options, okay? Verse 36 or verse 40. Let's cover those. So Daniel eleven thirty six 36 says this, Then the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. Or Daniel eleven forty. 40, reads, at the time of the end, that's the word Kate's there, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. Okay, so let me give you a few uh, possibilities that are commonly proposed, okay? So again, we, we kind of finished off at verse 35, and here's some propositions for verses 36 through 45. Number one, some believe that Herod the Great enters the scene here in verse 36. And yes, that would be the same Herod that we see in our New Testaments. Uh, then it shifts to Rome in verses 40 through 45. Number two, others suggest that uh, Herod is referenced in verses 36 through 39, uh, and then it kind of shifts to Rome in verses 40 through 43, and then back again to Herod in verses um, 44 and 45. Many say that verses 36 through 39 continue with Antiochus Epiphanes in view in that particular time frame, and then moves to Rome in verses 40 through 45. Um, so what do you think? Well, I'm not even sure what I think, to be honest. Uh, but you know what? I have a really, really hard time with the first two suggestions there, suddenly inserting Herod uh, here in this text. Now, I have read arguments for it, and um, and it just seems a bit out of place. It seems, you know, to all of a sudden, out of nowhere, uh, in one sentence, to kind of fast forward 100 plus years and start talking about a different king here. Uh, it just seems a little bit unnatural and a little bit disjointed to me. That's all I'm saying. So, you know, and I'm not real strong in my history here, but I have looked at it and it just seems more natural to me if, if the history fits. And from what I've read, I believe it does. If verses 36 through 39 are still re referring to the times and the events surrounding Antiochus Epiphanes um, with, you know, with the change coming in verse 40 with when the subject, you know, kind of shifts to the actual time of the end reference, you know, many times in within this uh, past within the past chapter. So I want you to keep in mind now this is important. There have been a couple references uh, in chapter 11 to an end, okay, with, with using the words Kate. And it not, not only that, but an end that was yet or that was still for an appointed time, as if that end was still for a uh, yet a future 
time, okay? Um, in fact, in verse 35, where we left off, uh, this is still contextually connected to Antiochus Epiphany. So what does Daniel 11.35 say? Well, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Now... I don't know, but I think that many assume that the time of the end here in verse 35 is referencing, you know, the time, you know, the same time as the, the Maccabean revolt against the Seleucids, when, when those of understanding fell, uh, it was their end. So the time of the end came uh, when the, the persecution and warfare was over for them. They were refined, they were purified, they were made white, you know, by prevailing through faith to the end or to their end. Um, but th this is the thing, but I do wonder if this time of the end here in verse 35 uh, isn't so much referring to that time, their time, you know, when, when they were enduring the Seleucid persecution, but rather the time of the end here is the appointed time still to come. It's still to come. It is yet future even to them, okay? Yet in their future, and those of understanding, they were being refined, they were being purified, and they were being made white for a particular time and a particular purpose that would be revealed when? At the appointed time. It would be the time of the end, which is what all scripture has been pointing to, the end of old covenant Israel. That was yet future. So really, this time of the end in 35 is pointing to, in fact, it's the same time as referenced in verse 40. I want you to think about that. Wouldn't these faithful Jews, you know, all these, these faithful Jews, uh, well, you know what? All faithful Jews throughout redemptive history, they would have been awaiting Messiah, would they not? You know, in his kingdom. But those faithful Jews who died under the law and had not been made perfect and had not received the adoption of sons, uh, they had not been redeemed. They had not experienced salvation because the one who brought salvation had not come. So maybe, just maybe, I'm, I'm saying, uh, these who were being refined, purified, uh, and made white were doing so because they too, in order to enter the kingdom, would need to be so when the end came. And when the end came and resurrection with it. What do you think of that? Maybe these Jews uh, were enduring to their end, just like the New Testament saints were enduring to their end. But you know what? They were all enduring to their individual ends in faith, those of faith, the remnant, <laughs> um, uh, to, so that at the appointed time, that's kind of what I'm getting at, at the appointed time, the time of the end, they would all together be raised up together with Christ into that new covenant body. And that's what I'm saying. The heavenly city that Abraham saw far off was approaching in the days of Christ. That was the time of the end. I don't know. That's just a thought. But you see, in my opinion, I think this is really consistent and it flows well. The appointed time of the end that didn't come in their day under the Seleucid kingdom and persecute or Seleucid yeah, kingdom and persecution did eventually come. And I think that we see that exact time of the end come just five verses later in verse 40. That's where the contextual switch or change or jump comes. The appointed time had arrived. Daniel 11, verse 40, it says, at the time of the end. Well, that's the same time of the end that we're looking for in verse 35. At the time of the end, that's the word Kate's, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. So the question is, 
if this is the same time of the end that all Scripture has been continually referencing nearing the end of Old Covenant Israel, that is, does a chronological jump forward you know, in, in to, you know, to Rome, or the Roman Empire, Roman Republic in verses 40 through 45, does that jive with the historical record? Well, I think it does. I think that verses 40 through 45 are really kind of a quick summation uh, or a kind of a, a, a parenthetical section that references the last struggle between kingdoms before Messiah came. And again, I think the historical references fit, at least the, the general you know, history that I'm aware of. Uh, what we see here in verses 40 through 45, um, they really line up with the details of the final years of the Roman Republic, not empire, the Roman Republic uh, as it gave way to the Roman Empire. So let me just give you a, a 30 second history lesson here. Okay, the Roman Republic had uh, really begun sometime in the 500s BC, 500s ish BC. Okay, but it really didn't rise to, you know, to world dominance until around the 200 and 100 ish BC sometime. So civil unrest, civil war, struggle for power within the Republic escalated as it always seems to do right and that's what we see here in verses 40 through 45 there was a real life soap opera a real life game of thrones as i like to call it that was going on between uh rome in the north under octavian he would be the king of the north here in verse 40 and egypt in the south under cleopatra and her lover and ally mark Antony, who, yes, was from Rome, of course. So, Mark Antony was Roman, but there was a struggle for power between him and Octavius. Okay, this is, this is the Roman Republic we're talking about. Now, ultimately, Octavius, the king of the north, prevailed over Antony and Cleopatra, becoming, this is interesting, he becomes the first Roman, uh, or the first, yeah, the first, basically the first Roman emperor, the first uh, Caesar Augustus. When, when did this happen? Well, around 29 B.C. Now, incidentally, remember King Herod that I mentioned early, earlier, he pledged his loyalty to Mark Antony, but he flipped and he flopped when he saw that uh, Antony's defeat was ine inevitable. So he, you know, he quickly pledged his loyalty to, to Octavius. And in return, he was allowed to keep his rule uh, or, you know, his leadership or rulership over Judea. OK, now this, my friends, is the Herod that we see when we open up our New Testament. So do you kind of see how these things are setting the scene to what we you know, open our Bibles to up in the, in the New Testament? Now, so why the heck is this important? I mean, why the heck do we even care about this stuff? Uh, if we do and you know what is what does this have to do with chapter 12 and that's what i'm trying to get at because i know you want to get to chapter 12 and all the good stuff uh, <laughs> you know like the tribulation and resurrection and the judgment and end of days and all that okay i get that well you know what what i'm talking about here the tail end of chapter 11 that has everything to do with chapter 12. so first of all like i just said it sets the stage uh, for the social and the political con conditions that existed when Messiah entered the scene. Not to mention, this really marks the beginning of the time of the end, right? For Israel, when they would come under Rome, uh, which would eventually, as you know, it would bring the total desolation of their city and their temple. This here, the tail end of chapter 11, is the beginning of of the end that's what this is we're setting the stage so um but here's why it's really 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 important at least this is really what i want you to see here this is why i think it's important this is why i'm taking the time to do this because i think that this just really goes over uh, most people's heads the reason i'm taking all this time here the tail end of, of chapter 11 is simple again chapter 12 verse 1 at that time at that time okay what time it's the time of the end that has approached in chapter 11 so what i'm telling you here's what i'm telling you 
whatever end and whatever time of the end or end of days, whatever ends that we see in chapter 12, and we're going to see a handful of them, that is simply a continuation of the events, of the timeline of chapter 11. And again, what time period do we see approaching in chapter 11? It's the Roman Empire. And that means we're approaching time of Messiah. It, all, it just keeps coming back again and again and again to the days of Messiah. Those are the end of days, the first century. Those were the last days when Old Covenant Israel or those were the last days of Old Covenant Israel when the appointed time of the end was nearing. The appointed time of the end. Again, we see that reference in chapter 11. That actually came to fruition. That time actually came. And this is huge. Uh, whatever developments, remember this, whatever developments or events that we see transpire in chapter 12, right here, unless there's some contextual change in chapter 12, all those things, all these things in chapter 12 take place in Israel's last days, the days that we see right here in our New Testament. Do you see how huge that is? So again, we'll get to this next lesson. Unless there's some contextual change or jump forward into our future, you know what? All these things in chapter 12 are going to have to take place in the first century. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, and I just don't think people kind of see this coming. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about that. So I think, unfortunately, uh, we have taken these, these end time events and we've misappropriated them into our future. Okay, we've inserted ourselves in the text, basically, and we've assigned the, the time of the end, or at least a couple ends in chapter 12, uh, you know, in the, in the events described into our future. We've, we've pushed them out, right? But they were only future to Daniel's people and to their future. Uh, and you know, it's funny, man, there is so much talk these days, you know, about the end times and, and questioning whether, you know, we are in the last days right now. Well, honestly, it just seems so silly to me. I'm sorry. It really does. When every single reference to a last days and, you know, the time of the end in the, in, uh, in the old Testament, uh, it's, always and i mean always it's always pointing at contextually connected and it brings us to the very same time period every single time again and again it's the time of messiah it's the days when he would arrive uh, and the events that would surround his lifetime and his people old covenant israel now all contextual evidence pushes redemptive history forward to a very specific time period and no further, absolutely no further in that time period is the New Testament time period when the Roman Empire was the dominant world kingdom. And right on schedule, Messiah arrived with his kingdom. I think it's pretty clear, but maybe it's not. Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled. <laughs> the kingdom of God is near. The time is fulfilled. What time is fulfilled? Well, I think it's the same time referenced in uh, uh, chapter 11. It's the time of the end. It's the appointed time of the end in chapter 11. Yeah, he, he's right. The time is fulfilled. That was the message. How about Galatians 4, 3 through 5? Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of time had come, you see, the fullness had time had come. The appointed time of the end had come. It had arrived. So what happened? Well, God sent forth a son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. So chapter 11 brings us very 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 close to the time of the end 
the same end we see here in uh, chapter 12, uh, com complete with uh, tribulation, final judgment, resurrection, and all that stuff that we'll look at next time. So, you know, I really, I just kind of keep saying the same thing over and over, and I really can't make it any clearer. When people move into chapter 12, and they detach it from its context, and they divide up the ends, applying some to maybe 70 AD, and then they throw others out into our future, man, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't make sense, and I think it just contextually rips everything apart. So, but we'll get to that next video. So, you know, I, I think I mentioned before, we're going to get to chapter 12 today, but I lied, and uh, I'm not going to apologize for that, by golly, because you know what? We have to be okay with kind of slowing down a little bit, uh, kind of hit, putting our foot on the brake, and, and making sure that we're clear with what's going on at the tail end of chapter 11 uh, before we jump right into chapter 12. And that's what I was trying to do today. So uh, sorry to tease you, but you know what? We will jump into Daniel chapter 12 next lesson. I promise you that. And uh, we will go from there. So after that, then we'll, like I said, we'll get into some of the um, minor prophets and then the New Testament. So. Until next time, thanks for joining me. Uh, questions, comments, they're always welcome. And uh, thanks for joining me once again. I'm having fun. I hope you're having fun. I hope this is making some sense to you. And we will see you next round. All right, take care. Adios.